good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Müller, and I, I'm, I'm the Python trainer of this Python Academy. So we do Python training since 2006, and we do a lot of different kinds of Python training, introductory Python training, advanced Python training, Python training for scientists. And one of our courses or tutorials is faster Python programs through optimization, and that's what I'm going to go through. Today, this is actually the, the, the handout you have. It's, it's a little bit. It's like a tutorial for a little bit longer, for for a few more minutes than we have here. Therefore, we have to go over a few things, but I still should give you some kind of general idea about how to optimize program. The optimization people ask me it's, it's about. It's not optimizing some numerical problems or something like this, but optimizing Python programs make them run faster, and it's a. It's a, like more like a basic introduction, what you can do and what Python can offer here. So everybody should pick up a handout. They are they're located there and here. So there are some paper that goes with it. And also, you can download the source code. So if you go to this URL, you will find the examples we want to work with. So, uh, so we, we probably don't have too much time to actually do too much exercises. That there's also a few tools you, might, you would need to install. So I actually haven't uh, sent out the, the links on there. You would need to install them. Most of them could be installed with Conda or Pip or something like this. But actually, since we don't do the exercises, it's not so essential to have it. I will show most of the things here, which would suffice for this type of tutorial because we only have 80 minutes which is not a lot, so doing an exercise easily takes 10, 15 minutes, so that you cannot do. But you're welcome to work along, do, do things with me. Uh, if you like, a lot of things just work with plain Python, there's quite a few things, and also you can work with a, uh, um, download, if you have a download, all the, all the source code is in there, and you can, should, most of them should work just out of the box. Okay, so a question. Uh, who of you is using Python uh, less than one year? Okay, people. Less than two? Less than five? More than five? Okay, it's a pretty good mixture of people uh, that, that work with Python. Though this, this optimization tutorial is not necessary strictly for scientists, it's for Python programs in general. So it's not, there's nothing special for scientific or data applications here, but for how you can make Python programs faster in general. And for this, there are a few rules that uh, you can use. Okay. Let's start quickly. So that's pretty much what's in the handout. So the first question, if you talk about making things faster, actually, do you, do you need to make it faster? That that's, sounds like a bit of a stupid question, but this is really a question you should ask yourself. How fast is fast enough? And this is something you really need to take into consideration. What do I need? Do I need to make my program faster or not? And what does it mean to make it faster? Because typically, if you make things faster, very often it comes at, at some cost. So it's not for free. You have to spend time on it, and you might make your code more complicated. The nice thing would be making your code more readable and faster at the same time. There are some, sometimes you can do this, but sometimes uh, you have to make your code more difficult. You have to install libraries, and you have to write more code, and you try things to make it faster. So Python, uh, it's, uh, it's interpreted, ever people say P uh, Python is slow, but for a lot of things, actually, Python is not that slow. If you compare with, with other uh, languages, there are quite a few things where Python is not that slow. Of course, for numerical computations, uh, when you do this, pure Python is rather slow, but there are a lot of solutions, and I want to show a few here you can use, though it seems like getting more and more solutions and it's kind of difficult to keep track which ones are the ones to use, but I make a few suggestions uh, what you can do. So premature optimization is the root of all evil, that's one of those famous things here people say and that's something really, really important, though optimization is not something you should start out with, optimization should be at the end of some kind of uh, Pro process you work with. 
So there's a few rules, so I wrote them down. So the, the very first thing is you have to make sure a program is really too slow. You really need more performance. Just if you spend a few days optimizing your program and the whole thing, the whole program just runs once, it doesn't, might not make sense to put a lot of time into optimization. And there might be a lot of other factors that are not actually Python related that are, can impact your performance. And that's the first part we spend on here is actually measuring what's going on. That's, that's the essential part of optimization. You have to measure things and do things. And it's really necessary to, to, to put this extra effort in there. That's a question you should repeatedly ask yourself. And then uh, for, for sure, don't optimize as you go. Sometimes you have a gut feeling those things is faster than the other thing, which is tempting, but I have to say it's very often I'm wrong, what's faster and what's, what's slower. And guessing is maybe not, not a good strategy. You really have to go and measure. And also use only realistic use cases. Don't just, okay, this thing has to scale and has to get very big. Maybe it doesn't get big. Maybe you do, do something else. Maybe you don't need, need to have this performance. And also architecture, how you set things up, can be very essential for performance. And this can be something that has nothing to do with Python itself, but with a lot of other things. So performance over difficult, uh, there can be a lot of things involved. And it's not really clear in the beginning what is actually, that's a problem. And of, so often do you have bugs. And, and the first thing you, knew you, you, you should do actually is should do profiling, that's what we're gonna do. And also, when you do optimization, you change your code and you might introduce bugs. You might change what's coming out. It's very important to, to really keep track that, that you don't change what your program is doing. Yeah? First, make it work right and then make it work fast. It's very important uh, to do. And we're gonna look at a, a few of the things what you can do for this. So there might be some things that, that might slow your program down. It has nothing to do with Python. One of the networks, network connections. Uh, one of them, you can have a database access. So we have system calls to the operating system. All kind of things uh, can, be, can make your program slow. And this is, sounds a little bit very common sense, but it's important that you actually uh, do this and uh, work with those questions, ask, ask them you repeatedly going through because optimization can, be, can mean quite a bit of effort. So it can mean quite a bit of time you spend on your program and in the end it might turn out it's not worth it because you, that, you don't know if you do optimization at the beginning if you, you really uh, can get something something out of it. So one thing you can do when you work with, uh, with Python, you can use uh, PyStone. PyStone is a test in Python you can work with. So let's go to our notebook. So you can say import PyStone and PyStone gives you some kind, uh, no, sorry, I have to, there's a the PyStone in, in the lib library test, there's a, uh, there's a module PyStone you can use and you can measure the PyStones uh, of, your, of your system. So if you go to the, to the library where things are installed, you can use PyStones. Actually, I have, maybe it's nicer to show it to you here because I have several of those things uh, executed. So if you go to the That doesn't work. Okay, uh, I have, have it here uh, shown you. We have Pystones. If you run this one, it's, it's lo located in the directory of your Python store directory for different Python versions. I did it, and you run Pystone, and then you get uh, a Pystone measurement which gives you some kind of uh, some kind of benchmark. Benchmarks are always a problem, but some kind of benchmark to see how fast your Python implementation is in general. And you can, can do this, and you can compare different Python versions here and see how fast they are, and you can see how many Pystones per second you have. That's something I did here for several versions, Python 2.7, and for other Python versions like PyPy, so if you use PyPy or Iron Python, you might see uh, quite a bit different results. You see the, the, the numbers here going up, with, with uh, Iron Python and PyPy, 
and this Pi-stone measurement gives you some kind of baseline how fast your Python is. There's always a problem that doesn't apply to everything, but you can see uh, how fast your Python actually works. And if you repeat the test, this, it sometimes might get, get even faster. From test import Pi-stones, you see I have the code here. I've forgotten, actually. So you can... Uh, import this from test and you can make can run this on 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 your on your machine so everybody that has a uh, from test import python and you can run it and you can see the measure for your for your machine why doesn't it work Uh, should, there should be in the standard library. Yeah. No, no. Test is not in there. It's probably something... I, I didn't try this installation, so you should always try things. Then you have this nice effect here. In a normal Python, so there's there's another there's a there's a different test here installed, and when you use IPython, the, the IPython notebook. So if I go to the if I go to the normal Python interpreter and start Python here, then it works. So it's it's a standard install. I didn't try it there. I have a normal Python 2.7, and if I say from test test import uh, Python then you get the Pystone here, and then you can, now it works, you see it should be there. I don't know why it's not uh, working in an IPython notebook, I haven't tried it from there. And then you can have use Pystone.Pystone, and you get a measure of those Pystones, and this is some Pystones, is in plural, yeah. And then you get a measure how long it takes, and you see you have this, this numbers here. And this is something you can compare different Python stores and different computers. This would be something if you, if you run the program with different, with different installations of Python and different, um, different computers, you might use this one uh, to work with it. So let's, let's, I, I wrote a small program that helps you actually convert things to, uh, to, to Pystones. So if you go to, if you open um, measuring, Pystone converter, this is a small Pystone converter actually that doing exactly this, it imports the Pystone here and then it converts to kilo Pystone because Pystone is a very big number and it's divided by 1,000. If you're even bigger, you might even buy convert by another number. And then you get some kind of measurement, and this measurement you can use to compare different Python implementations that might be useful for a uh, few things. Okay, let's go. The first thing, the a very big important thing is when you work, if you look at code, it's, it's profiling. Though the profiling thing, uh, that's my Pystone thing, the profiling thing, uh, you, you, should, you want to profile how much CPU you use. We're also going to look at profiling a memory usage, but the first thing is you want to look at the CPU usage. And there are several tools. There's a profile hotshot, but the recommended tool is cProfile. You should use cProfile, but the problem is if you do profiling, it always introduces some overhead, and this overhead might pretty much distort your profiling results. Therefore, you... Uh, should you see profile which tries to minimize uh, the overhead and is doing just a kind of a good job giving you some kind of reliable results. So let's have a look at, um, let's, let's have a, look at a, a small program that I wrote that's called Profile Me. So if I say load, whoops, I'm the wrong one. Load, you can open an editor of course. Uh, measuring profile me. Then uh, I just wrote a program here with two functions. You see I have two functions. 
One is fast and the other one is slow. And then I use fast and use slow and then I uh, run this, have this program. And now you can use C profiler uh, to, to program this. And in, if you use IPython notebook, actually it's built in already. The, the printout here has how you, how you can do this when you import profiler yourself. But if you're an IPython notebook, actually you can use uh, the profile option here, prun. And if you do this, it's running your, your program under the profiler and should give you some, still running it, should give you some output and showing you what happens. And that's exactly what the handout also says. So the profile is running your program and gives you very nice statistics what's going on. So you can see what happened and you can see which function actually took how much time. You see, now uh, you can actually see where the, where the time goes. You have the total time it takes for the whole thing, the time for one call and the cumulative time, which in this case is the same here. And you see you have 200 calls to this, uh, timing module here, and it tells you that it's called that many times and how long it takes, it takes per call. And then, you see, some, some of the numbers are so small they don't even show up, of course, they, they have this rounding here, they don't show up. But then you can really, most of the time, this is a very useful tool because now you can really see the bottleneck, which function uh, call or method call uh, takes up most of the time in your program. And very often you have the case that only a few functions take up most of the time. There might be cases there you have a lot of functions that take up more time, but here uh, you can really see that this one function time, that where the time sleep, that where the time goes and where things happening. And you can uh, really tell uh, what's going on here. And then if, if you want to look at the statistics here, if you do this, you can imp import it and can import C profile. You can also write a program like this. You don't have to do only an IPython notebook, which is nice for interactive work, but sometimes if you want to profile more, you can pro profile more and you can see more uh, outcome there. And then you have the statistics. You see they have a number of calls there. You have the total time, uh, the per call time, uh, and so on, cumulative time and also the line number. That gives you quite a few uh, information about your program, and this is something you should always do. If you're an iPython notebook, you can also use, I used here, in this case, this double P run, but you can also use a, a simpler thing. You can use a profile with a 1% sign. So if you work in, in iPython, uh, the 1% always concerns more or less one line, and they have 2% sign that concerns the whole cell. So now you could measure how long things take to compare uh, the, the run times, and this one gives you should uh, give you something. Uh, should never run. I'm not sure why it's not working. You should give me them. I did it so many times, and it's just not going to work now. I'm not sure what's wrong. It should give me the, the output from, from one line. So this one, this is a full, no, sorry, time it. It's time it, so I'm not really here yet. It's time it and time it is doing what you want. So time it is it's not a real profiling, time it is just gives you the, the run time of this one line. And with time it, you can uh, time one statement in Python and you can see how long it takes. And as you see, it's doing 100,000 loops and you can tell uh, how, long it, how long it takes. And if you do something else, you will get some other 
auto uh, time measurement. Yeah, so you can run any kind of uh, yeah double. So if it's if you use a double one, you can also use time it. And time it is is smaller, just gives you timing. Whereas profile goes through the whole code and gives you. It's it's very useful if you have a larger program with m multiple function calls because you see all the function calls. Whereas time it, you just get the time measurement for the thing what you're doing right now. So this one uh, can help you to. to do interactive thing. And it's very nice because you see, I have a few examples. If you use Timeit from the standard library, you have to set up your code and do a few steps. Here, you can use it interactively and you can quickly get a feeling how fast things are. And sometimes you are surprised uh, what is fast, what is not fast. It's not always that obvious. And you can measure here and can see how things, how things work. There are also different things. If you import the profiler, you can import. Uh, C profile SP, so make it short. Then you can also use uh, the make an instance of a profiler here if you like to, and then you can have more leverage and can just run single single functions through this. So I import this one, and then I say profiler uh, dot run call, and then you can run the call. There's different options what you can do with it. Now I can specify the function I would like to, to, to profile, use slow. So I imported the whole thing in, in my namespace here, so I can use a function. If you do this uh, in the normal import, then you might have to put the module name in front of it, and I just imported it here, now you can run it. And it takes a, takes a while. And this one doesn't show the output here, which is unfortunate. This has a, I haven't tried this in, a, in, in the active IPython notebook, though the output is somewhere else, obviously. Uh, it's gone. Now I have to, have to get it out. Profiler, so it's not shown here, profiler. Dot, uh, print stats, and you get the statistics now. And you have this for this one function. So you can actually, sometimes you get a lot of output, and you're not interested in the whole thing. You just want to have a, uh, a part of the, the program. Then you can use run call and do this run call. So there are multiple options doing this uh, profiling. And you can work with it. And you can also, if you like to, you can also store the this results in a file, and then there are a lot of tools actually use working on the files. We're going to look at one of those tools that helps you to, to get a good feeling what's going on. Because if you get a, lot, a, lot, a big table with a lot of numbers, it might not be the best thing uh, to look at. And there are some graphical tools that help you doing, uh, doing profiling. So you can also uh, run a string. So that's, uh, let's, let's have a look at here. We have to go a bit faster, maybe. So you can, if you like to, run a string. Uh, that's what I did uh, so far. I just put in the function object itself. But you can also run, put a string in here. So a string you could always generate in, on the, in the runtime. And this gives you uh, also the output for this, for this function. And now you could also specify a file. And see now, I specify the file f start, fast starts here. And now Python stores the results of this profiling in this file. And this, there are quite, quite a few tools that can read this file later on. The simplest one would be reading it back here with, uh, with the pstarts here, so, uh, which I did here. So you can run it. And then uh, you have this. This file fast starts, which is produced here, and then you can look at the stats and you can, can see your table later on. So that would be you can put it in your program. If you have a bigger program and it's running longer, you can write your own small tools that help you to do some profiling. So maybe your program gets started over and over again, and you want to profile things. Then you can store those things in these files, and later on can look at it and read those files and get the statistics back. That would be one way, one way of doing it. And uh, this can be very helpful. 
we have also a tool, a graphical tool that helps you to visualize. So it's the, the, the uh, things here. Yeah, and now you can print uh, starts, and then you have different kind of sorting options, and you can just limit how, how much output you want, and you can sort things in all kinds of uh, ways here. You can sort it by time and, uh, and show all lines, or just have a limited number, and this is pretty good analysis already. And also you have this caller, so you can find out who called whom and how this uh, belongs together here. Which function is called? You just start print callers and you just put in the name and then you see actually uh, what happens and you can find out which function calls which function. This is a very simple example here, just a few, just two, uh, four functions in, in, in total, but if you have a real program that might be way more complex and it might not be the obvious how things work and this gives you some way to get some more details what happened in your program. Yeah, so, and you can also have it the other way around. So who called whom or who was called by, who called by whom can be, can be analyzed with this print starts call these here and you get uh, this out uh, and find out what happens. And then you have a lot of statistics. Total starts gives you, uh, total calls gives you so 203 calls. Yeah, they have two loops with 200 each and three other function calls outside. That's the number of calls you have. So it does quite a bit of information. Uh, the problem is maybe you have uh, too much information maybe, and that's why we have some graphical tools later on to analyze this one. Measuring time, it's a different thing, difficult thing sometimes, because as soon as you measure influence your system, and you'd want to, you want to try to uh, reduce um, the, the influence of your system as much as possible. And when you measure, unfortunately, there are some differences between operating systems if you just use time time. That's why here I have this uh, um, differences here. You see I have for different, uh, uh, with different methods, if you use different methods. If I use clock here and if I use time time. So time clock is one method to get a timestamp and time time and a default timer. And unfortunately, there are differences between different operating systems. So if you run this on this with time time or clock on different operating systems, you might get different results because sometimes they have different meanings. And that's why it's recommended to use time it default timer to get a timestamp. So time it default timer gives you gives you a timestamp here. Yeah, they all give you timestamps actually, and then. Uh, you see, I just subtract this. When I do this with the three methods, I get a timestamp before, I run something, and then I get a timestamp after this here, and just get the difference between, I have the three different methods, and then I print out uh, what those three different methods give me. That's a, a typical way, just get a timestamp before and timestamp after, then you know how long it takes. And then if you do this, then you see uh, OS times, provides the CPU time in all operating systems, but uh, with six decimals. Uh, if you do a, a time clock, there's a CPU time on Unix, but wall, wall clock time on Windows. So it's a different thing. It means a different thing, but you have to be careful. But it's more accurate on Windows because you get more uh, decimals out of it. That's why you should choose default timer to measure things. So default time it, the module is, is doing this. If you go to Python 3, they cleaned up it. This thing's up, you have some new time measurement functions in Python 3, so you won't have so many uh, uh, specific, uh, operating system dependent things. So you see here, if you if I have this, you only have this, this digits here, not so many digits, and you have some differences in the precision. And that's a problem. If the precision is not good enough, you measure something, then you might not be able to measure what you're doing because your time pre measurement precision is not good enough. That's why if you have strange results, you might revisit what you did, and typically using time into default timer is the right thing to do. Don't go just for the normal time module. That's a different thing. So if I do this on Windows, you see in Windows I get a, a bit different results here. This, you, look, you compare the, uh, this, this time clock, you see the duration for the default time was about one second, and here it takes about 0 0.4 seconds time clock, whereas here uh, time clock and the default timer give you the same result because they are essentially the same thing. 
So you have to be careful if, if your program runs on different systems. Of course, if you do the t measurement always on a Unix system, then it, things might work, but if you move to a Windows system, it might be different. That's why you should use default timer uh, that, we, that you can, can use. So this is a small script that helps you to measure both the wall clock time and the CPU time. So the wall clock time is actually the time that, that, that really runs. So you have a time slip in front and a time slip in the end, and that's really the time that elapsed. But the CPU is, is time is just the time that really the CPU is was using for, for your program, because typically in your computer you're not alone, there are a lot of other things happening, and you would measure them also at the same time if you measure wall clock time, uh, and you don't measure, don't measure uh, uh, CPU time. And to do this here, I have a small script, which is also on your hard drive, on your download. And see, this is just a few things, so it should run with Python 3. I make it compatible with Python 3. Renaming range and X range here. And then I have this, this small helper function here, which can be useful. So depending on, the, on your platform, this is Windows, Win32. This works, also works in Win64 bit. 32 has nothing to do with the 64 bitness, it's just the API. So this should work with an all current Windows versions. You use OS times zero, otherwise you use time clock. That's something, at least in Python 2, you have to do this to get uh, a reasonable measurement of CPU time. And then if you use those two functions on different operating systems, I cannot really show Windows here because I don't have uh, Windows installed here. I would need to open a machine which takes too long. But if you use these functions here and just do, this, do a two, two loops, one is just sleeping for two seconds and the other time is doing something here, adding one plus one, uh, 100 million times in the loop. And I do those things, then I get, get these results on here. So I just profile, profile those two test methods. And here, the profiler, if you like to, you can supply a different method. You can apply a different function. In this case, the, the function I just wrote myself. You just throw it in. And now it's not using the default thing, which is a, which is a wall clock time, that meaning actually measuring the time that really elapsed, but rather my CPU time function, which is different, and you get a different result. So if I do this here, then uh, you see the results at this uh, place. And if you compare uh, the run times, you see uh, different, different out, outputs. This is one is, is, a, is, a, is a one with a wall clock time, and this one is one with a CPU time. And if you look at the numbers, of course, the wall clock time numbers must be bigger than the CPU times because the CPU time is really the time the computer spent using a CPU in your program, and the wall clock time would include everything else that happens during the time on your machine. So even if you have a multi-core machine, typically uh, other things happen here. Now you have some a different number here, and you can distinguish between CPU time and not CPU time. And I have, at least for Python 2, I haven't found other solution than writing this function yourself. So I go back here. So this is a function I used. Yeah? So I used this OS times gives you a tuple. This all lot quite different times. And the first entry gives you the... CPU time, and on Unix systems, you can use clock for this. So that's important to actually know what you're measuring. There can be a lot of pitfalls. You think you measure something, but you measure the wrong thing and have a wrong understanding of it. Therefore, those kind of things should be taken into account. And as I said, you can supply your own uh, measure function. And here we have the, the, the output at on Linux machines, and you oversee this, uh, the time is also, because it's now it's a little bit different because there's a different CPU and stuff like this, so you cannot really compare them, but the relative compare, you see now the, the wall clock time is bigger than the CPU time. You can do the same th thing with Python 3. Python 3 also does it, so it works, and then uh, this thing, yeah, it's Python 3. So, this is something I would like to urge you to look at. You always have to know what you're measuring. And it happened to me several times that you keep measuring something and then you realize you're measuring the wrong thing. You're using the wrong method and you have some assumption and you, uh, 
we cannot really give too many general uh, uh, um, recommendations. Uh, uh, only just have a look and try to figure out what it's actually doing. Uh, otherwise, you might go down the wrong path. Okay, let's look at the, some pictures. So there's a very nice tool called Run Snake Run. So if you like to, you can install it, but maybe it's too much now just to do it in this tutorial. You can download it, Run Snake Run. It's written in Python itself using WX Python and Square Map, and it gives you a nice, very nice um, graphic view on, on the statistics. So you use Profiler, you save your results in the stats file, and then you can use the stats file to uh, look inside. So and it looks like this. This is my uh, my result of the program I just was running, and this is very obvious. You see, all the time is spent in this. In the, in the, this is the time sleep. So every, every all the time is spent in time sleep, and you can really see it at the first view how things happen, and all the rest is just a very thin wrapper around calling this time sleep. In the left-hand side, you can go through and you can look at every single function. You have a lot of other dynamic things you can do here. And now, uh, we have the next picture. It's the same thing, type sleep. And this is the other one uh, where we have some more things going on. And this gives a little bit more interesting picture. Now, so you have more, several functions running and you can see how it looks like. And then this is... This is an example if you use NumPy, when we do the same thing, the same thing we do with the other function, we just saw this in plain Python, you use NumPy. You see NumPy is using a lot of libraries, obviously a lot of calls, and it looks a bit different. So you don't have this nice picture with one big block anymore. There's only this here, and you have a lot of things happening, and you can look at, at what happens. Um, now, of, co uh, of course, it's much more difficult to optimize because you don't have this one picture. Uh, uh, working and looking and you see, okay, this is a function I need to optimize. It's just now two things and a lot of things are in, internal in, in NumPy. You wouldn't be able to optimize anyway this way. You could only optimize the usage of this function. So, you know, this function takes a lot of time and if I could maybe reduce the number of calls to the function, but it gets more, much more complicated and that's more how a typical program looks like and you can look at every of the single boxes and can see what you can do with it, yeah, and this can be very useful. Okay, uh, C profile works only for full functions. So the, the smallest unit you can have is a function, so you cannot look inside a function, but there is a helper here, and this helper is a is line profiler. So if you use line profiler, then you can go and profile things, and actually you get an output like this. So you, you have to kind of install line profiler, which is written in Python, and this gives you a nice line by line break, breakdown of your call. So if you do something like this, you get um, this is a normal C profile output, and the line profiler is, you can use as a decorator, and that means so if I put it in like this, so that's that's what I have here. I just put this add profile in front of it, yeah. Add profile, and then the line profiler is actually inspecting this function. The problem is line profiler puts a lot of overhead on your program, so it makes things a lot slower, but still gives you some kind of useful information about the relative time you use for every single line in your program. So using this, this line profiler uh, can be useful if you have uh, methods that are longer and you really want to know what's happening inside those functions here, and then you just put this profile there. And it's always easy to turn it off, so it's just some decorator. So if you like to, you can just have a decorator that's doing nothing. And then the effect of line profiler would, would go away. And then if you run this here, if you run it through this, this Kern prof, it's written, written by Robert Kern, that's why it's called Kern prof, then you can go through line by line. And then this takes apart your code line by line. And you see an output that gives you information about every line. And see now it repeats your source code here on the right hand side. Repeats your source code and gives you uh, information. So the information here, how many times the, this, this 
is, is called, how long it takes, and how long it takes per, per hit per run, and then the percent of the time. So it, you can see now uh, that this, uh, the most of the time is spent, 99.4% of the time is spent in this fast call, and only a very small part actually is for this, for this X range here. So the, obviously the, the call, the function, is much more expensive than going through the loop. This is something C profile would never give you, but line profiler gives you a thing. And if you do slow, you see you get even 100% because it's rounded to, to one digit here. Then this slow is so much slower than it takes up 100% of the whole uh, time here. And you see that that's the real times here. The, the loop takes essentially the same. You see there are some differences. It should be the same number, actually. Why should it be different? Yeah, but there are some differences in the number here. So if you repeat this run, you might get some different numbers in, uh, around some ballpark. But you can see the time here for, the, for this uh, slow function is much bigger than for the fast function. It's a much bigger number here. And this is something this, this line profiler can give you. can give you a very nice uh, overview uh, of things to doing. Now, I, have, I wrote a small, small uh, example here, Accumulate, which accumulates the, 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 um, the it's like if you calculate the sum of, of a list of numbers, but you keep the intermediate results, you can use Accumulate. And that's what I wrote, and just to see, just as an example for my profiler. So I wrote a small function here that's actually doing something. It takes this uh, iterable, so it takes anything that can be iterated over, which has numbers inside. And then I go through, and I just remember, it takes uh, the last element and just add it to something and append it. Of course, you don't, you would never do this by hand if you use NumPy. Uh, NumPy add, uh, uh, accumulate, it's built in, it's much faster, but just as an example here, you can use it, and you can accumulate things, and now I do accumulate for uh, 100 and uh, 10 and 100, just use my function, and then I run it through my, my current prof profiler and see what's coming out. And it shows me, okay, my file accumulate here is run for a pretty short time. And then I get an output and I get a very nice breakdown what's happening here. And you see uh, how much time you spend actually on which operation. The doc string is no time here. And then just accessing this iterable zero is a small portion of the time. Then going through here and the slicing takes 23% of the time and all this assignment takes some time and they append. They take pretty much the same time, but 20, 30% here. And then they return. And then you can get a feeling where you might be able to, to where it's worthwhile to optimize here in your, in your loop. So you can, uh, there's another one, a very interesting one. So I have this uh, calculation here, some mathematical calculation as an example. So I do this every, everything separately. I just generate number plus 10 times 10, the power of 10. Then I use the built-in function power. Then I use mass square root and I use square root, which is uh, just imported. Yeah, so I do import mass. And here I say uh, mass uh, square root, just the access to square root and square root. And this square root is, the, is, from, is set up here. So I just make this shortcut. And this, very, this can be very interesting. You see how much time those things take. And uh, if you go through, then you have a breakdown. So I do 100 calculations here with this number, and then uh, I look at the, the breakdown, and you see the most time actually is spent in this power function. So the plus is very, very cheap, yeah? Something plus 10 is cheap compared to the power function, and you can see this double star on the power function take about the, the same time, whereas the power function takes a bit more time. And then if you use, if you call mass square root, it's a bit longer, not much, than using square root because the access to the square root is a bit longer than square root. So that can be important if you have a tight loop. We do a lot of things, so access to these attributes. If you have a lot of attributes in your access, that might take time. So that's something uh, you can do. Let's expand on this idea a bit further. So if you have this, um, this function actually here, we use this, this profile, and it's just a dummy 
this, this doesn't do anything there. So this is dummy. Uh, if, you, if you want to run it without the, the profile, then you can do something like this. Otherwise, we, we have, a, have, a, have, a, have our own um, uh, profile function. The thing is, if, if I run it with clone prof, then the, then the profile will be defined. If the profile is not defined, I get a name error at this place. Then I define my own decorator. My own decorator do, is doing nothing, just return the plain function. So if you have worked with decorators, you, you might look very familiar. Otherwise, this is just a small tooling to make it possible to keep this add profile in your code without any changes. And if you run it normally, nothing happens because only the beginning, this, this this profile function will be defined and will just take any function and return the function. But this happens only at once when you import your script. Yeah, everything gets decorated with this profile. Otherwise, uh, the profile of uh, this uh, current prof, this line profile, is used. Therefore, you could keep the profile inside your code and you wouldn't have any overhead when you when you actually run it. That can be pretty useful. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's familiar with decorators? Yeah, only a few people. So decorator is, is, uh, is something, this is a decorator, and this is doing something with a function, if you've simplified. And this means this decorator, which I define here, is doing nothing with a function. It keeps a function alone. That's pretty much what it's doing. Yeah? And this is, would, be, would make, well, I, I, usually I don't like to put something in, comment something out, so you can keep this add profile in there and wouldn't essentially would, no, would be, mean no overhead. And if you run the profile, you just can run it with a con profile. That's, that's something that uh, works uh, pretty nicely. And this is only, of course, only at the mod module level. If you wanted to have it in a whole module, you have to put it into uh, built ins, which is maybe not that nice. Okay, let's look at this local referencing game here. So uh, having this, this, uh, this square root here, here, this square root assigned, so I do this as this access, mass is a module from the standard library and square root is a function I'm using. And then uh, I say for x, for something in, in x range and access square root. And here I don't do this, I access mass.square root uh, directly. And I would like to measure the difference, how long it takes, just a small thing. If, if it doesn't make a uh, difference or not, so I implemented these two functions, and then I do my thing and run it to the profile and see how long this takes here. Line by line, there's a line break, breakdown for those, those things. And then uh, with a, this is a normal, if I, if I use it as a normal vis a -vis option, I get this uh, normal C profile output. And you can see the C profile output just gives you a, uh, this by, 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 by function call. And then I can have it with a, with a, with a minus L option. And I get it to get the breakdown line by line. And actually, I see where the time sits inside my, my function here. And now you see if I... If I call this local ref here and the module ref, they take about uh, the same time. But running, actually running this program, if you run in the command line, you will see that it takes much longer. So uh, line profiler adds a lot of overhead to your program. So you usually you don't want to have something running all the time with you because it can make a program really, really slow. You see the total time is here 125 seconds, whereas here the, the total time is 15 seconds. So it's a big, big difference. It's nearly an order of magnitude difference if you use line profiler with minus L instead of using line profiler with, uh, with, with a normal option, which is just essentially C profile. So it takes about 10 times as long, nearly. And, but you get, a, get this breakdown here, and you see what happens. And the problem is, line profile works only on the, on the Python level, of course, and shows you only Python function. If you work with NumPy, then you, you don't see a lot because you only see the calls of, from NumPy. Okay, this is something that can be very interesting to see where there is potential to, to, make, things, to make things faster. Most of the time when you talk about uh, optimization, you talk about optimization of 
CPU time, but you can also optimize memory. So sometimes you have programs that use too much memory. And of course, as soon as, as your program is kind of swapping your disk, everything gets very slow. And therefore, there's also some tools for memory usage. And I've, I found two I'm using here, and I want to just introduce them to you, that you can see those tools are there, and they can be pretty useful. There are some tools in the, in the standard library. Uh, you can get the, the, the size of memory of an object, but they are not as comprehensive as those tools. The first t t tool is actually HEAPI of the, from the GAPI framework that helps you to analyze uh, um, memory, it's just, it's, everything's just Python 2, so it doesn't work for Python 3 yet, as far as I know. Maybe there's some new compile, and just, they had some problems to moving to 2.7, but now they are to also able, available 2.7. And here, you can get, the, get, the, get, a, get a fingerprint how much memory is used at any t given time in your system, and you can also break it down who's using memory. This can be useful if you have a problem, if, if your program is running for a while and is using more and more memory and it shouldn't, then this one can give you some, some help. Let's look at some example how you can do this. So you just import and you say heap HP, which I imported here, yeah? I make an instance of this uh, HPY, and then this is HP, and I say heap, and I get a, a snapshot and you see how much memory is used here. You can see the memory, and it's, it's broken down for data types, st the strings, then dictionary of, mo of module, and so on, and has a breakdown of those different data types and shows you how many percent are stored, or are used by these different data types. Yeah, And then you can just, I make just a big list. I now I'm in an interactive session, and I make a big list, and if I do this, I get a new picture here, I look at the heap again, and then you see now it's very obvious, it's full of ints. You see, I made a list of a million ints, and of course now you have 61% used by ints and 20% 20, 20 used by the list itself. Yeah? So the list itself just has references and uh, to the int, and then the int is an own object, and the object itself has some overhead. It's bigger than a reference, obviously. And then you see that 81% of your memory is used actually by this list because it didn't, it, you did, it didn't have it before, now it's just the increment that you have here, and you can see that the list is using this memory. So you can do this. Um, when, you, when I delete my list, now I delete my list, then I'm pretty much the same state. You will see if you do this repeatedly, it always gets some different numbers. Seems like it's always changing, and those numbers are not very exact. So they cannot be used for very small quantities, but they can be very useful for big. So if you have memory problems, typically you have problems with, with a lot of memory usage, and then it works. If you have just, if you want to see small differences, you won't see a lot. So let's look at them, some example of what you can do. You can use set ref, and actually set ref sets it back to some kind of zero level. So that's what I'm. Uh, there, there are still a few here, there are still a few bytes used, as you can see here. That's kind of something you cannot get rid of. There's always some error connected with it, but this is pretty much your baseline is zero. Now you can say set ref. Now you can do something and can measure again and can see how, how it changed. That's what I'm doing now. So I can create my big list again, and then I do another uh, heap here, and then you see, now you see pretty much this is about 99% sitting in my list. So the 1% is some, some kind of error, which does a measurement problems. But you can see, uh, when you do the set ref before, do something what you want to do and do this heap again, then you see the difference what happens with your memory, and you get some breakdown. So you don't have actually the memory for every single object, but you can see the difference before and after. So that's not perfect, but it can be pretty useful, because you can actually measure something, you can see the difference here. Yeah, and you, you could just kind of put it in your program from time to time and see if, this, if those things are getting bigger and bigger and what, what, what causes your changes in memory. So, uh, then you can get a lot of information out. So if you, you have this, if you make the instance of this heap here, you can say set, and then you have the size here, and then you do it again, then the size goes down. Then I create my big list, and you can have size. So you don't get this big print out there, but you get one number for the size. And this is number you can calculate and can see what, what happens and how things, how things work, actually. 
And I keep doing this. See, I said ref, this is pretty, pretty much my zero. Yeah? I set it back to zero, and then I create my big list, and you see that this is a difference. Yeah? And this is a very small number, this is bytes. Then this is pretty much my, my arrow. See how accurate it's it approximately. And then uh, I set my reference again, and you see when I do it again, I have um, pretty much back to zero, more or less. Yeah? And then you have multiple options what you can do with this, this is object. This is memory object, so to speak, and you can access single lines. You can, uh, you can ever order everything by all kinds of criteria. One would be by, by type and other criteria. So you can have some information what's going on with the memory. And that's very often the most important thing with, with this optimization. If, the, if you know the problem, that's actually the problem is, the solution might be pretty simple, actually. Very often it's difficult to find out what the problem is, where, where the memory goes. And if you find this one, then very often, at least my experience, you say, oh yeah, that's pretty obvious, but I didn't see it, because yeah, that's how it goes. Finding the problem is pretty much the biggest thing, the biggest achievement. So you have more, you see more output, more, more lines, and you also can call it by referral. So you have m multiple options what you can do with this data, and you see a lot of, lot of output here. So now I have, a, I have an example here. So that's the source code you also have. Let's go through this here. What you actually can do with this, with this uh, memory thing. So this is just the plain library. And I have an example how I could use it. And I, 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 use a, I, I write my own decorator and use a decorator to do something. See, I have here a global memory dictionary. And I import my H, HPI, uh, HPY from, from Guppy. And func tools, func tools are need to write a nice decorator. So if you don't know what a decorator is, then this might look a bit weird to you. So this is, this is a new decorator, and this decorator is called measure memory. And this takes, takes a function that's supposed to be measured. And then it's doing the magic here, because now it creates a replacement function. It's going to replace my function. And then has this, you might have seen this one, star double star syntax that takes all kind of arguments. And now I do the same thing I did before. But I don't do it repeatedly in my code over the place, but only once. That's important. If you find yourself copying and pasting things many times, then there should be a better solution. And the decorator can be a good solution for this. So actually, I create an instance of this HPY, set the reference back to zero. That's my uh, initial memory here, my initial memory size. Then I call my function and return the result. And at the end, I just store my memory. I put everything in the try except just, just in case this function throws an exception. I still have the memory. Yeah? Because fi finally it will be called. And I, this is just a normal dictionary. And every function has a name. So I use a function name and store it in function name. You have to be careful if you do this. This works only if, if all the functions have unique, unique names. If you apply this decorator in many places, then you might also want to put the module name in there. So it's different with every uh, function should have its module name. But if you just put it in one file, then it works. It's just the, the principle. And then here, of course, I make another snapshot of my memory and uh, take off the original one. That's pretty much what I did before in single steps. Yeah? But now I put it in this decorator thing, and then I have to return the function. So this underscore thing is a dynamically created function that's going to replace the other function. And you should always use functual wraps to make it look nice. Otherwise, you would lose your name and your doc string, all kind of things. That's why. That's how a, how a decorator looks like. The decorators can be a bit involved if you're not used to this uh, thing, but just take it as a recipe, so you, which kind of takes a snapshot of the memory before the function call and after the function call and stores the difference between both in this dictionary memory. And once we have this running, then you can test it. And that's how you use it. You just say measure memory here, and then the, measure, the, the memory difference of this call before and after the function call will be measured for you and will, stored, will be stored in this dictionary. So that's a very easy. Yeah? And this is also just a decorator. And we've seen before you could replace this decorator with a decorator doing nothing. So if you have this decorator 150 times in your code, you don't have to comment it out. You just replace it with a decorator doing nothing. And your code would run without any problems. The only override would be in the very beginning, 150 times moving functions through this decorator doing nothing. But in our case, now we measure the, mem the memory. 
and then I just print it out. It's just an example. So if you run the command line, you would see the result. Just because I have, don't have so much time, I can do it interactively. This just takes quite a bit of time if you type everything. So now we have this example, and if you look at it, you get uh, um, no output. Yeah. Maybe we need, maybe I need to run it. And don't have output, then I probably need to go and run this file. So that is a file memory size. So I can run it from the command line because I have it installed there. So no, I, no, no, no uh, I pass a notebook here, just run it from the command line. Yeah. So I have the one. The first one is called measure um, measure size, I think. The first one, and this is a check. What's the name of the file? Is yeah, measure, measure size. So if I if I run this with normal Python here, and say. Uh, Measures, measure size, memory size, it's called memory size HP. And then you see uh, that's, a, that, that's a memory I use here. So this is stored, you have a dictionary with a, with a function name. That is, the decorator puts this function name in here. As I said, if you want to make it a bit more usable, you should also put the module name, that would be unique. Otherwise, you have two functions the same name. The last one would override it. And then you see that's a used memory. Of my of my function of this function I'm using here, yeah. This somehow doesn't react here. So this is this is my function down here, but I'm using and this is just actually returning a number. Uh, this this list range number returns a number, so it, yeah, there's actually a a change in memory. You can also measure the growth of the memory, how, how memory is growing. So we have this memory growth, HPY here, uh, PY. And then it's a similar thing. I also write this one. This takes a function argument. So this time I decided not using an, a decorator, but use a different approach. Just use a normal function that takes a function as the first input. So you can also do this. It has, everything has advantages, disadvantages. The decorator you have to apply in your code and write it there. And here, I can just import the module and run it to my test module and test functions. And that's what I'm doing. I do the same thing. I make an instance. I set everything to zero. I get the size. I call my function, and I measure again. That's pretty much the same thing I did before, but with a different technology. I just don't use decorator. I just use a function, which is also, for other use cases, can be useful. And then I do the same thing. I have a test here. And see, the first test is, again, returning, uh, returning my, my list of that many numbers here. And here, uh, actually, I uh, go through these numbers and append something uh, to, to this list. But I don't, I don't return it there. Uh, actually, I, I, I don't return, but I app append it to this data here, to this list. I append this x and let it grow step by step. And every time. It, it, this list grows. And then if you run this one, then you have a different, I have to go back to my, my shell and see how things, how things are running. So I have this Python uh, memory grows, and then you see how it's, how it's growing. Memory grow, HP, and then you see if you make this, make big in this case because uh, uh, I don't store this big list. Yeah, I create it, but I throw it away. The garbage collector collects it. Essentially, that's essentially, that's essentially my zero here, this number. And the other one, if you say, if I append this to, the, to this global list, you have this change. So this is, again, go back to, the, uh, to this, uh, this source code here. This is the first one. You see, this uh, returns the range, but I don't, I don't save the return. I throw the return away. There's nobody, 
doing it. And here I have, a, have this data, and this data stays around, and I put something in data. And then I measure, I use uh, uh, this check memory and put it through yeah, here, but I don't save the result. The, the, the result of this one is saved in this, in this global here. Well, actually, it's in, it's in the test function, but it's saved in data, and here I don't do anything with the result, or the memory is not used. So you can see the effect. So it's very often to, to do some kind of uh, check that, that the, thing, the tool works just like, like you think. And that's always a good experience and if things work. So there's another tool which works similarly. So H, as I say, this, this HP uh, existed on for Python 2.6 for quite a while. And you had to compile for Python 2.7, which is usually not a good thing if, because it was not that easy to get it compiled. There's another tool called Pimpler, and Pimpler actually is a, grew out of three other objects, uh, projects, and they put it together. And now there's, it's very similar, and you can also use it, and you can use a similar technology to do it and compare those results also. So if you do this, uh, if you use this mem tracker here, which I uh, import, yeah, I make an instance of the summary tracker, and then if you look at the diff, you see the diffs from before. This is supposed to be zero because nothing happened. And if you do it again and again, sooner or later, you will get to zero. There's always some kind of uh, little bit measuring error of objects you have. You want to get, get to zero. And then I have another, the same approach, the same decorator approach, so the code is pretty much the same we had before, but I just use the summary tracker and do something here. And you see I do something five times and try to set it to zero, so I call this that ref five times to get close to zero, this diff. Then I call my function, return my function, and save things. So this is exactly the same, and you can do the same thing with Pimpler. Uh, do you have a second tool? And it's a good thing to have two tools. If they have the same result, it might be right. If they have different results, one of them must should be wrong. Or both are wrong. Who knows? Yeah, that's something you can do with Pimpler. So it's pretty much the same code as this, this, uh, described here in text. And then we have the same thing here with memory grows. I use this uh, same approach. And again, I run five times, set it this diff to set it to zero, and then do another diff and return this one. And you can see the, uh, the memory that's used in between. This is exactly the same code we just looked at before. That's something you can do. And that really can be, can be useful for things. And I want to show you some interesting example. Yeah. Uh, because now we, want to, we actually want to measure how the memory is allocated for a list. That's something that might be very interesting. So and I, I use different functions. I use uh, this Pimpler offers uh, two functions, size of and flat size. They have different meanings. And you will see how, how this works. And then you can. Here, I inject, so to speak, the, the method I would like to use. In this case, flat size is a, is a, uh, the default, and I can, but I also can use size of. And I just make an empty list and just measure the size of, of my list right now and put it in the list. And then I go through many times and I append to this list. So my list, I append something. My list, I want to measure. And this mem is my result of the measurement. And you see, I also say append when I append the size of the list. So these two appends are two totally different things. This is my object I want to measure, and this is my result. And I just continuously append the size. And you should see the, how the size is growing with every append. Every append should be some increase or not, if it's the same size for some reason. And that's what I'm doing here on return memory. Yeah. And now I uh, just have a small test function where you have the size in here. And now I go through. Now I can write a, a, a loop over this different function, flat size, a size, and this get size of. This is this from the standard library. So in Python, functions are objects. So you can put them in a list, write a list, a loop over functions. And you don't have to write it three times. You just do it once. And then uh, I just call this, this function I just wrote. I put in the 1,000. And then here, I supply this function in there which is important. And then uh, I try to do the matplotlib, make a nice plot out of it. So if, I, if matplotlib works, I do a plot. Otherwise, I just show a textual output. So everything in here that's try except is just output. So this makes just a normal, very simple plot, a matplotlib. And this one 
gives you the whole thing as a table. So if MATLAB is installed, it shouldn't work. Uh, if you have uh, Anaconda or something, then MATLAB will be there for sure. But if it don't, it's just a plain Python install, then you get a table. So it's kind of thing. So it's a bit tooling here. And you could extend this tooling. And if you do something like this, you get this, pro this if you call flat size, then you get only the size, uh, the size of the list itself. Then you see, it's very interesting how the size of the list grows because the list doesn't grow continuously. Python's always allocating more memory than you need and then filling the elements. That's very important for, for efficiency. And if you have, like, if you can measure, if you have 100 million appends to a list, you have about 100 allocations, you know, 100 of the steps. And I have 1,000. You see, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The very small steps and the bigger the list gets, you get about more or less, as of, it's not exactly 50% more memory. And that you can see how the list itself grows. That's very interesting. But you can also see if you use the, the size of, then you get the whole list, including all the elements in the list, all the numbers I put in. In this case, I put only integers. You could have more, uh, more complicated things. And now you see uh, it's a different thing because now I also measure the, all the numbers. Every time I append a number, Python creates a new integer. And this integer is measured also. And you see the number is much bigger, of course. Yeah, but it's pretty much steady. And you see this. This jump is pretty small compared to this goes to 35,000, and here it only goes to 10,000, the, the scale. So it's about three and a half times as much, more or less, memory you use because you use the numbers also. So this gives you a lot of kind of feeling what happens with your, pro with your program, and this might help you later on to, to find, maybe it's a bug somewhere or some kind of limitation thing you did, you can change. The problem, if you don't know what it is, you have to guess and try, and it can be a very difficult game. If you have something like this and you see the picture, a lot of things might get much clearer immediately. So if you use uh, the, the built-in function uh, sysgetSizeOf, it's the same as flat size. So the, the, the Python itself has, uh, has um, sysgetSizeOf, any object, and if you do this for this list, I get I get something like this, and this is essentially the same thing as flat size. But it helps you to measure memory. And now we also have the growth of the list. If you grow a list, uh, it's, it's the same thing here, uh, and just have, the, have it going here. And you see you have the, the size of one integer here, and then you have this, the old size of the list, which I take off, and then I just go through here, and gets the size of my list, it's a new size, and then you, I subtract from the new size the old size. And if this is greater than int, I, I, add, this, uh, I add a step. And then I set the old size to new size and return. I see how many steps it takes, and you see how many allocation, this is to find out how many allocation steps you have, just measuring those steps I had in this, uh, in this, this graph, you don't want to count them by hand. It's just a simple thing. Uh, you measure whenever this is, is growing, then uh, you get a, a, a number, and you see that's, that's the allocations. You see, if, a, if you have 10 appends, you have about three allocations, and if you have, a, that's a million, if you have 10 million, you have about, yeah, that's 10 million, you have about 100 allocations. So that gives you some overhead, uh, some insight what Python is doing. And get size of and flat size of give you the same result, and this is, then you know, okay, append is a very, you know this already, you can, you can look it up, but you have, a, have it as numbers, uh, what append is actually doing to your list and how things are growing. So this gives you some, maybe some flavor of what you can do with those tools. You can get inside, you have to be creative because your problem might be different and you have the building blocks to build your own small tools. And with this decorator approach I showed, you can actually put them in your code and turn them off just by, with one switch using a, Decorator that's doing nothing. I think that's a pretty good technique. So you, of course, you, do, you want to auto automate as much as possible. You want the computer to do the work and not yourself going in there and at 150 places copying something or co commenting something out. That's not, not, nothing you want to do, usually. And with this decorator approach, uh, uh, you can actually keep this inside in production code and just turn it off if you want to. And it doesn't have any effect. Only at compile time when you produce a bytecode and import things, which is very quick usually. It doesn't really matter most of the time. There will be very few cases where this could be a problem. OK, uh, there's also the equivalent to this line profiler. There's a memory profiler, which is going line by line. So you can also get a, 
your, your memory measured line by line. This can be interesting. So you can, oh, so we're running a bit out of time. You can do this line by line. And then you can uh, have, this, have this function here with a lot of things that I'm doing. And then you can use this memory profile and run a line by line. When you see a line by line break, so here, how much memory everything takes, what you're doing. You see, this is a list comprehension. And if I use a list comprehension and then make a sum, I use quite a bit of memory. If you use a generator expression, make a sum, you, it's, it's even too small to show. So that's very interesting. List comprehension, generator expression, difference. You see what, what happens there. Uh, and you can get some feeling uh, how much memory it takes. You see, this one uses not so much memory. And if you delete it, it, it will re freeze it. So it gives you some insight what's happening with the memory. So it can be interesting as an academic exercise to know. But if you have a problem, then you can pretty much follow where the memory goes. So there would be, so if you narrow it down with, with this bigger tool, then it takes the, the line memory profile and go, go line by line. And you can do the same thing. You see, and if you do it for this very big number here, then you get a pretty big difference in terms of memory usage for those kind of things. I don't know why it's 90 here. Sometimes you have to be aware that sometimes this tool makes mistakes. That working over is a problem, memory measurements, stuff like this is not that easy. And sometimes this tool, the tools might make a mistake. And if you use it in a different order or something, which should give the same result, it gives different results or something. That's something that can happen. And you can print this out and you see uh, uh, the things. OK, I see um, how much more time do we have? OK, only three minutes. So I'm probably, I'm probably uh, did. Uh, you didn't get everything through. I think the measurement is my, my, my important thing. That's actually uh, to find out where the problems are. Then the solutions, there are a lot of solutions, and I want to go through a few of them. Or actually, the handout has, has them. The, some solutions are just small algorithmic changes, which can be very amazing at places. And the other solutions would be actually using big tools. And if you, if you hear the conference, you will see a lot of those big tools, which are NumPy, Numba, PyPy, Sizen, Python, and maybe five others. I, maybe I don't know some, some Copperhead and all kinds of things. So there's a lot of different things you can do depending on the problem you have. So there's no real general recommendation what to use. And this is, would be the second part, which I totally skipped now because we are pretty much out of time. Uh, but I think the measurement is, is very important that you get a feeling that the problem could and then you can start using some of those tools and putting it in. Yeah, so I have another example with all those tools. But the first, and the, I think there's the most important thing is you have to find out what the problem is and narrow down the problem. If you have 100,000 lines of code, you don't want to kind of look at every line of code. You want to narrow down at a few important lines that might cause a problem. And this is, uh, this is the thing. So I have the next section, if you if you <laughs> welcome to read through, would be about small kind of recipes doing things. Uh, Python, what, what, is, what is Pythonic in pure Python? And then I have example calculating pi and using different types of tools and looking at the differences you get out of it. Uh, and as I said, there's even more tools than I can even touch here. Uh, but you will see a lot of those in action here at the conference at other tutorials, other talks uh, about those things. So like string coordination is one of the things we have patterns and lists. In generate expressions, we looked already at the memory usage, which is also time usage. If you can use general expression, you save a lot of time. And uh, local, local and global variables. We did this with this mass square root, for instance. There's a lot, there's a lot of so small things you can do, small tricks here and there. Instead of using a global, using a local variable uh, here. So something, instead of going doing this global here, saying the local is the global, actually, this would give you quite a bit of difference. If you do this and look at this, you need, but you are 25% faster. 25% is quite a bit just for the small assignment. And those kind of things you can try. The problem is you should never just, you should measure if they really are effective. They might not be effective because other things are much more important than the small things. And it's difficult to, to, to guess. Sometimes I'm guessing something and it's, I was really off. Yeah, that happens. But if you measure, you you're probably better off doing this than you do in the profiling and see things. Yeah, and using the built-in names and the local names, it's even worse. If you set true to true here, then you save a lot of time because now you don't have to go to the 
all the way up to true and look for the true, just set as a local true. If you need it a lot in this thing, then you have about 40% savings. And then, of course, data structures, which is an important topic. So I just can maybe have a few minutes run through. Uh, if you use built-in data structures, you most, most of the time much better than coming up with, with anything you're, you're of your own. So you get a lot of comfort and a lot of speed most of the time and have a few examples here using lists or sets for different types of things. So sets can be very fast for different types of things. You can do just some, some examples here, just have to skip over. And you compare something when you see the difference between these two. This would be something we probably don't have so much time here. And this is just an example list or there are some special data structures in Python, like a deck is a double ended queue in Python that can be useful for a few things. And I have an example for this one. So it's not always better. There can be also use cases where it's slower, actually. And I measure this here with an example, uh, doing some few things, which, of course, not you can understand immediately what it means. Default dict is in Python in collections that can do a few things. So, so small things that might be useful. Um, they might not bring anything. And then, this is maybe the, the, let's conclude with this. This is an overview of this, what's called the big O notation, so the, the complexity of algorithm, how long it actually takes. And you want to stay with, those ones are very nice because O1 means they're independent of the size. So if you say lang list, it doesn't matter how long the list is, it takes the same, if the list has one element or one billion elements, <coughs> it doesn't matter. It takes about the same amount of time to do this and a few, a few other things like typically X in dictionary in the normal case, it's independent list. So that's why if you search for something, you use dictionaries or sets, not lists, if you can. If you do it often, of course, you're much faster. This one is depending on linear. So if, if, if this list is twice as big, it takes twice as long if you do something, loops. And log n, so it's getting a bit longer. So sorting, typically in Python, sorting is pretty optimized, but it's typically how long it takes. And then nested loops, for instance, would be quadratic. And this would be pretty bad already, so if we have a a million elements, a million by a million is 10 to the power of 12, and it can take a long time. To do an everything higher, you shouldn't even consider. So that's something uh, you, you, should, you can know uh, about which, which data type. That's pretty much what we did before with the examples, now just a little more formalized in this table and put together. And this is some small things, but those small things can be effective. Yeah, you should always reach for the simplest things, the small things first and look for them. You might solve your problem, and you don't have to go for the bigger guns and do bigger things like using uh, GPUs or whatever you, you think. You might be, might be just changing. If you go from here to there, that can be a big difference. Or if you could from there to there. So if you, so instead of looking, looking in a list all the time, looking in a dictionary, there can be a gigantic difference of many, many orders of magnitude. You will never get with any compilers and your tools. So it is just algorithm and data structures are interconnected because the data structures come with, with algorithms in Python, how to, how to work with them. Okay, so uh, this is the data structure thing. And then you have some examples for this uh, here uh, where I have some different kind of data things I'm using and the measuring things, some code examples, always with numbers. So see, and then that's the difference here, 2,300 times faster or slower, whatever you want to look at. Uh, things. So everything comes with numbers here. You can see that I like to have C numbers at the end. Uh, only fast and slower is maybe not enough. And then have a bunch of an examples here for these kind of things. So they have a more, uh, more things about caching. I don't know how long we can run over. Caching would be one thing if you need to recalculate things again and again and again. The caching would be one technology and they have some recipes here how to do caching again using decorators all the way through, which is a bit complex. You can do caching and can put things in caches. There's a decorator putting things in caches. So this is some technologies and recipes or things you can, you can do and different kind of things if you can empty your cache or not. This is, of course, we don't have time. Least recently used, used cache. Uh, actually, there's now in Python 3 has it in a, in a standard library. So you don't need to implement it yourself, but it can be interesting to see how those caching works. Okay, then the next thing would be, if you look to the handout, just to give you a short uh, outlook, uh, using different methods to using numerical code to, to use uh, Monte Carlo to calculate pi, which is very simple, uh, but very de computationally demanding 
algorithm. And now I use different things to, to do this. Fortunately, this is embarrassing parallel, so you can parallelize the heck out of it if you like to, no problem. And then you can use pretty much all tools you have. Very often the algorithm is not that nice, and you cannot parallelize things like this. This would be uh, the, the next thing. You're out of time, is this right? Kind of? Yeah, so the story is a bit, uh, a bit too much, but I think that my main point was the measuring thing and then giving you some, some things. And you see a lot more tools doing things fast in the conference. Uh, so maybe the focusing on the measuring and profiling kind of thing is important. That we really know if I have a case to go for the big tools or not. And then there's a lot of small things that are very easy, not much effort you could do. And as I would recommend you go for the algorithm first. If you can improve your algorithm, you can get a thousand or ten thousand times faster, maybe, if you already have a problem with your algorithm, and no other tool would give you this speed up in any, any case. Okay, so let's go to the, to the end here. So the end has, a, has a, just an overview of those different types of tools. So some of them I introduce in the course, some of them I don't. So there are some, some tools here you can use. That's by, by no way exhaustive, and I've just learned a few uh, to talk during the break that there are more tools I should put in this table. So there's a bunch of tools that can do a lot of things. But as I said, they won't be totally helpful if your algorithm is off. They, they might be slower than a very nice Python algorithm. So that's the very first thing you should do. Okay, we should stop now because there's break. We want to stay in, in time. Uh, sorry for this kind of condensed thing because maybe there's, there's so much you can do with optimization and we have so little time. But hopefully you get a, a good overview. You have the source code, you have the handout. Uh, if you don't have one, pick one up. And if you have a question, you can have questions now and also ask me in the break. Thank you very much. <laughs>